Help us to do the right things, dear Lord. Help us to always look to others and help them in any way that we can and help us to love them the way you loved us and things that we can do for them, dear Lord. Just help us to do these things and uh, so that we can be better Christians as we strive, dear Lord, to come to he- get to heaven with you someday. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's another Wednesday night. I'm thankful that you're here. We, we pick up in Galatians. Uh, I don't know if you want to go with the slides. Uh, that might be... Glad we have the TVs at work. This might, might be a little easier for us to see. At least it is for me, even. Uh, and I'm sure it is for you. We're thankful for that. And I'm, that's one of the, the good things. Our congregation finds things that we need and makes it happen. I think it'll be a, a great benefit for our church for years to come. So we slide over to the PowerPoint, if we can pull it up. And I'm just going to go quickly through these. I hope nobody has epilepsy or seizures, so just close your eyes if you do, because we're going to try to go through this as quick as I possibly can. We've got a lot of material to cover. So we picked up in Galatians at the end of the section was chapter 3, particularly verses 15 through 29. But if you remember correctly, justification by faith was the huge topic up before this, that none of us on our own merit can make it to heaven. It's only because God saves us and because God has deemed us worthy. Nothing you or I can do, will do, ever will, can possibly even think of that will ever save you other than coming to Christ. That's the one place that will save you. He's going to continue this argument. This argument's going to continue, uh, and we'll continue looking at it. The argument's this. If you remember the first example that he shows that, that they were saved by faith was themselves. They themselves had been saved, not because they kept the law, but because they came to Christ. Uh, so they themselves are the first example. The second would be, if I remember correctly, I want to say he goes into Abraham, and then from there the law, and then he's going to go into Christ. He's going to go through different arguments for why we are always saved by faith, not by works. So we move along, we continue the argument. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these. I want to say we might have read a few. Do you remember that promise that God gave Abraham? He promised him the seed, singular, not seeds, uh, because he's going to have lots of children, but he's going to have a seed that God promised him that would bless all the nations. That only comes through Christ. And so he's building the argument further for him, and we continue along. Um, let's see. Uh, now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until faith, coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. The law's purpose was to get people ready for Christ. That's his main purpose. And many of them weren't ready for him. Unfortunately, they didn't see him in the Old Testament like God wanted them to. So in order that we might be justified by faith, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Why keep the old law when you've got a better one now under Christ? Um, so the argument's made, he continues further, uh, talks about his customs. Uh, let's see if we keep going a bit further, right? So uh, this is my favorite section of scripture. You, you can read these. Hopefully you can finish chapter three. Key section is verse 27, right? Uh, 27, 28, all have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Um, so, And that's the seed promise. We are children of Abraham, not because we kept the law, but be Christ, because Christ made us his children. And by becoming his children, we became Abraham's heirs and Abraham's sons. Even though we are not Jewish in any sense, we have a reward and a promise that God gave Abraham. That promise was for us, and it's only possible through Christ. So one of my favorite sections is coming up, unless somebody had a point to make. Uh, Go ahead, Steve. Sometimes I don't think this seed thing comes through to us real well, because in English, seed can be plural too. Let's yeah. Write down first because when I want to put seed in my field, I don't want to put one seed in one each hole. Yeah. <clears throat> I want maybe one in each hole, but not one in each acre. Yes. Yeah. Because you're not going to have much luck, are you? <clears throat> I right. mean, it's just the way it works. And so, seed can be. I mean, when when we use the word, uh, sometimes. The singular sounding word seed can be really plural in English. But yeah. I don't think that's the case 
Not in, in Hebrew. In Hebrew. It, it would have very, <laughs> very specifically been. I can give you another example. In English, we say dear. Yeah. Use that singular plural. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other examples, right? And it's very tough in English grammar to tell always how many is included. That's not necessarily the case with Hebrew. It's very, very specific. And that's what he's trying. That's the, that's the attention to detail I want you to see is that Paul made it very clear. You should have caught it because he said it was singular, not plural, right? We have always looked. I would, I would venture to say if you asked a Jew about that promise that Abraham had, they would have said, well, that would have been Isaac and then Jacob. And their idea of the seed would have been many children, many different, you know, they had a Jewish physical flesh mindset. And what Paul's trying to say is, God has always seen spiritual children. Not, not phys- your physical birth and your heritage, those are all great, but God sees right through those things. And he never intended you to put a whole lot of trust in them. He wanted to put trust in, him, in God. So Paul's just logically very sound. He's arguing and building a case for why they should not go off and follow the old law, why they should not go get circumcised. Because if they do that, they've got to keep every single bit um, and, and it logically makes no sense. And so you've got this great argument he builds. And the biggest part is Jesus is that seed. He's fulfilled the, that old law. What point would there be to go back now, right? You've already seen it fulfilled. No man, none of you can keep it. And he'll get into that later. Again, chapter 4 is my favorite. Hopefully we'll have some time to jump into it. Because Paul doesn't just use scripture to make his argument. He also just uses reasoning. Um, and that's why I'm trying to highlight this. You know, Paul knew the inner workings of the Roman family. Did you know that? Anybody here know the inner workings of the Roman family, family system? Right, so we're going to jump to this. And this is a good book if anybody ever wants to have a great study. Uh, this is a book that I read back at Freed. It's kind of the do's and don'ts of how, like, if you wanted a collection of all the Roman sources there are about family, marriage, you know, divorce, how the family structure was. You know, in the family structure of Rome, anybody know how that operated? Who had total say? The husband, the father, had total say. I mean, we're talking life and death. If he didn't want the child, the father said no. There was no child kept. That's, that's how serious they had power. Whatever the father said was what the direction of the family would go. Uh, so a lot of times we don't think of this. This is where you've got to put your first century glasses back on. Um, and look at the world and how it really was in the first century. In the Roman world, uh, virtues such as, pay, you know, uh, for the men uh, being in charge, uh, furthermore being militarily involved, these men were, I mean, manly men, if you will. We talked about how in Honduras they have a macho attitude. What do you think Rome was? Uh, very much the same idea, that they had full say in the family structure. Uh, and so this is a great source if you ever really want to dig into Roman society, how it operated. Like, it goes into the gladiators and into the games and everything else of, of Roman society. One of the things that goes into great detail is the family and how the father has total say even over his children. When I say children, I mean plural, male and female. Father had total say as long as they were still his children. Go ahead, Ben. When Jesus showed up on the scene, he changed the dyna- dynamic for women 100% from what it was. Oh, yeah. It was abysmal. I mean, it wasn't, there's not existing of it. Uh, so that carries over when Rome conquers a place, that dynamic is expected when they, con- you know. And so this is something that per- perpetrated the entire known world is you have husbands that have total say over everything that their family does and does not do. And that includes their male heirs. So everyone knows the structure of having your male heirs, right? They usually have more say. They usually, I mean, you kind of think back of the prodigal son in Jewish society. Once he reaches a certain age, he has more say. Not in Rome. If, you're, if you are still listed as an as a heir or being brought up still, you weren't considered an adult male, you had zero say of anything. Your father wanted to send you to school in Cyprus, but well, you're going to be getting on a ship to go. That's just the way it worked in Rome. And so he's going to use, this, this dynamic is going to come up that Paul is going to bring out. You, you all know the family structure of Rome, how the, the father has total say until he's gone and there's an inheritance passed. So he's going to get into this dynamic that most of the time we don't even talk about. So at this slide, I'm sure most of us can't read it very well. Uh, but that being said, when a, when a family had a girl, 
men, especially the husbands, sometimes would just abandon their girl children because that in Roman society, passing male male inheritance, the, the, if it was a male, you were guaranteed to keep it because it could pass on the family name. But I'm not joking with you. The men of Rome, they, they had choices if they kept their daughters or not. Um, and they really had that kind of say, and no one could change. I mean, there wasn't a, well, if your husband doesn't want his child, he's going to abandon the woods, call this phone number and call the Senate. And maybe, you know, that, was the, that was the father's right. Um, and so we, get, we, we really do glorify, I glorify the Roman Empire. Um, but this is, the, this is the family structure you had. You had where, as in, in Scripture, what's the husband supposed to be to his wife? Caring, loving, right? We studied that this last Sunday night, right? The opposite was true in Rome. They, there was no arranged marriage. There was arranged marriages, so there really wasn't this loving bond between husband and wife. It, it was an absolute mess. And Paul knew it well, up to the point that he can make, a mar- make an argument based on it. We'll get into it. So here's the argument. He says in verse 1, I mean, I mean that the heir, that's being the son, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave Though he is the owner of everything, is that not true? I mean, he is going to one day own everything his father does. But until that day, he owns nothing. He is, in, in Roman society, a heir son had the same authority as a slave in the home. A lot of times, who do you think looked all after the male sons of a Roman family? A very trusted slave. So when it came down to it, if his dad's upset with him, who's he going to blame for his job? You see where I'm getting at? In, in honesty, in Roman society, the slave had more rights and more say, more authority than the heir did in a lot of ways. I mean, many a times, a servant was put in charge of the child till they were to a certain age. So that's what he's talking about here. In Roman society, you know that's the case, he says. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we, being Jews, also, when we were children, under the law... We're enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. They were enslaved to trying to keep the law. Just like, you know, a servant, I'm sorry, back then a child had really no say, no right, no special treatment. Guess where he's getting at? The Old Testament, the Jews following the old law didn't have everything that we do as New New Testament Christians. And I bring this up, I'm not sure if many of you think of it. Who did Abraham go and send to go find Isaac's wife? Did he send Isaac and say, go on your merry way, find who pleases you? Who did he send to go find his wife? His servant, master of his servants. So, I mean, you can see this principle already back in Genesis that in a family, until that son reaches an age where he is a, 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 an adult, he has zero say in things. In fact, Abraham's servant had more say than, than, than Isaac does, doesn't he? So you can read that account for yourself. He makes him swear that he'll go back to his country and find Isaac a, a wife. Here was what I'm going to tell you. Isaac is, a, is, is what, by our standards, he'd be an adult by now. Most people argue, and I'm a part of the group, that Isaac was probably a full-grown man or at least a grown boy by the time that Abraham tried to sacrifice him, which was two chapters ago. How much older is he now? He's old enough in our standards to go look for his own wife, but that just goes to show you age didn't matter what mattered was that father decided till you were of age, and until then, you owned nothing. You did not have that kind of privilege that your father does. In fact, he would set slaves over you so you wouldn't have any, which is a very smart thing to do because what do you do at 18 years old when you have a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of estates and anything good? So, in fact, this, this was a very smart thing uh, because a lot of times when, what you see in the Roman Empire, when the empire was passed off to another emperor that was young, they weren't ready for it. And sure enough, they would. They almost ruined the empire many a times. Caligula, Nero, all very young men who did not have the luxury of being raised up and having the... They, they had whatever they wanted at their fingertips since they were a young kid. Many of them did have struggles, but many of them were pampered to know. And what happens when that, those people get into office and they haven't learned the ropes? They don't know how things work. They just are entitled. Well... Doesn't go well. Go ahead, Steve. Another thing to support your, your, your view here, Isaac older. He would he, he may have been more than a teenager, probably more than thirty, because he was out in the fields alone. Servant came back with 
And he went to his mother's tent. Right. And I'll let you figure out what say, they did. I would say that Rebecca was a fair amount younger than him. Yes. Because when it comes to the two sons, Isaac was, was of old age, purely blind, and Rebecca was still pretty uh, spry, working around the house and knew what was going on and everything. Which seemed to be, a, that's very much a custom, I know that's odd for us, but most of the time the, the husband-to-be was a lot older than his bride-to-be, if you didn't know that. So, <laughs> you know, but He might have been what we would consider retirement. Yeah. Well past retirement. Yeah, and, and I think even, that's a perfect point. It's, it's the next chapter, chapter Abraham dies. Sarah's died. Abraham's about to die. We're in later in periods. I mean, he's not a little, that's why he's at least in his, probably his 20s, 30s. You're probably pretty close. Um, and so that's, that just gives you, you know, firsthand evidence. This is, this is a very normal thing in ancient times. To us, this isn't, right? You, in, your, in our own world, right, you don't just slowly get, you know, we don't, we don't put, we don't have servants, so there's one thing. But our children, we, we, we try to slowly prepare them, but not necessarily this, this harsh or this way. I mean, I'm serious. If your father sent you to a school anywhere, you were going. You were going. Uh, in fact, when um, I'm trying to think, Julius Caesar was murdered. Augustus Caesar was out. He was in a school somewhere out in the Mediterranean, and um, I'm sure that his father, whoever, probably sent him there um, and had no say until Julius was dead. That was became his uh, his parents. I mean, he he adopts him at some point. Go ahead, Linda. So we're one chapter behind that. And that's the tough part is, chapter, how do you know how much time's taken place through these, right? That's, that's a difficulty. But I would say he's an adult. I mean, chapter 25, he's, he's 40. Um, 25, 20. Yeah, 25, he's 40 years old so that, yeah, when he married even, Rebecca. Okay. And that's when 24 happens, right? He's a, he, he meets her. So these are all good points, uh, and I appreciate it because it's building our case even more. They knew this even better than we do. Right? This was normal in their day in life, and what he's trying to connect the dots is, if, if you go back to that old law, you're going back to like you were children again. You won't have the same rights. You won't have the same liberties that Christ gives you. That's the whole book of Galatians is don't go back to the old law. Enjoy the liberties and freedoms Christ has given you that you can't get back there. And so he's building that case even more. Why? If anybody want to go back living under their parents? That's an adult. That's what they're doing, folks. God is their father, and they're trying to go back to when they were children. They sh- they're Christians. You don't want to. Why would you want to go back to be a child living under their roof? And that's the idea is God has given them more freedoms. Why would they ever go back? Uh, go ahead, Linda. The girls, so they're trying to find guys, and then they have to have money before they can get them. But my friend Balaji and all of them, they had their girls picked for them. Yeah, yeah, that's arranged marriages. And you got yeah, endowments, do. which, you know, that's very that's a very ancient scriptural thing. I mean, that's it's in essence, I want to say that Abraham had to... I think they're sort to, of getting out of it a little bit, but they're still... Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a shame. Um, that being said, though, that was the norm back here in ancient times. The Muslims, um, you wasn't allowed to see the girl at all. I know I have, I, I don't talk to him that much, but he's a Muslim from over Islamabad. And when he married his wife, he said he only seen her when she was little, but then when they was ready to get married, I think they were like, maybe like, I think they were related, I don't know. But anyways, he married her, and he wasn't allowed to see her at all. I mean, weeks and weeks before the wedding. He wasn't allowed to go to her house or nothing. Yeah, he wasn't it's, allowed to see. I'm sure that has more to do with their culture. I, I know I didn't see Amber the day of our wedding till that was my own personal choice. Yeah, the it wasn't day like we a, sort of do it. Yeah. Tradition. yeah, they're doing it for months, right? That's a little but harder. There was isn't a it? longer yeah. time. I don't know. I don't know all the customs and cultures, but I mean, we're playing into that. These people are very, very foreign. This is foreign to what Paul's used to. Uh, Not to interrupt you, but uh, I was looking at a, a a YouTube movie on. Sodom and Gomorrah, and, you know, I always wondered why when they were in the house and Lot told them they couldn't have 
have them men because they were going to have sex with the men. Yeah. Um, and they he said you can have the girls. We'll see. And it said in there that it was probably. Doesn't that make you feel great? Your father offers because that. Because yeah. the guys were so more important. Well, and I, it didn't matter. Yeah. And it is, that, that, that is a, a point you could make, that women were very undervalued, yeah, so weren't he, they? He had sooner them. Well, and, and then I think he did, and I think they abused them. And yeah, well, I at least know when they when they flee Sodom and Gomorrah, how, how what happens with Lot and his daughters, anyways. I mean, I know they think the the world has ended, but they trick him into that. I, I just I, I see, even though they were supposed to be a, a, a faithful family, they had their issues too. And Lot, and Lot had him. Lot did the same thing as Sodom and Gomorrah did with his because he got drunk and then he had sex with. The daughters. daughters, yeah. I mean, I what mean, difference do you see? Yeah. yeah. In sexual. But then Lot in the New Testament, he was yeah. the father of God. I mean, he was, I don't know how, but somehow he must have. Yeah, yeah. And that's, well, that gives us hope, doesn't it? Somebody like Lot that made just as many mistakes as us, maybe even more, that he could still be found faithful by God. That's, and that, he saves us by faith, doesn't he? Thank, thankfully, he saved Lot. Would have saved his whole family if they would have listened. Um, and so it just it's, it is. It's extremely uh, sad to see, but this is the culture they live. Sons, we we say, well, they must have had it easy. The truth is, they really didn't. In a lot of ways, they were treated just as equal to slaves. And his argument is, why would you go back to that kind of slavery when you have such freedoms in Christ that you've never known? And and, and they makes that point. And so. I think it's important to look at verses 4 through 7. I try not to read every verse of this because we're trying to get a more overview of it. But I think this is a very important section of Scripture. Um, so I'm going to spend just a moment on it. Verse 4, um, Jesus came at the right time, the right place at the right time, at the right circumstances, under the right empire, under the right... God had it perfectly planned for this to be executed, right? You once were slaves, but Christ is giving you freedoms and God's planned it all along, why would you disrespect him by going back? I mean, you're, just, you're spitting in his face. He sent his own son to die. And, and I think that's the message he's trying to get. But for verses 4 through 7, that, the perfect timing. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So God knew when he would send him. It was going to be at a set time, at a right moment. When it was going to be a time when the Jews were still under the law. God had a very, very detailed plan. And I, this is something we learned in school, and so I'll, I'll just quickly talk about it. That fullness of time. Christ had been born when Alexander the Great was conquering the world, been the wrong time. If, if Christ had come, Babylon was ruling the world, been the wrong time. If it was Persia, you see, God had in mind for Christ to come exactly when he did. But think about this. What if Jesus would have come? 30 years early, still in the Roman period, but 30 years, you see, God had a very detailed plan. He was going to come at the right time, at the right place, born by a woman, and under the old law. God knew every little detail, and it was prophesied about, and it was predicted and fulfilled. Go ahead, Steve. And not only that, he prepared the, a, a Jewish nation to receive the Son. If there hadn't have been nation of Israel that had received the law, mm. then it would have been like the Canaanites. Yeah, and that wouldn't have been his plan. I just, yeah, or even later. Think about this. If he had come 40 years later, what would have been happening in Jerusalem? There wouldn't have been Jews to receive him. It was destroyed utterly, right? So this is just really a, a statement of God's intention. God knew that they were enslaved by that old law and he he prepared a way to fix it, not man. Man was unable to. They had tried. Many good men had lived. They had given it their best shot. Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel, all great men. But they were not going to be the ones to fulfill this, were they? It was going to be Christ. And it goes even further. You know, It was the perfect time for Christ to come. You see how the gospel spreads after Christ's death, burial, resurrection. You see how fast it spreads in 20 years. Anybody know what, what was a big instrument of why that happened? What was the, one of the biggest causes? Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, the Roman peace and yeah, the roads. the Roman peace and the roads. Yeah. Um, I, this is from teaching homeschool for yeah. way too many years. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, you know, because the roads were the best in the world, um, whenever um, the 
Christians were persecuted, they had great roads to run away on. They did. And they took, they took the gospel everywhere they went. Every single bit. And that, yeah. that aided Paul. Those right. roads made it so much easier for him to go through Asia Minor and yeah, then and over the to Greece. that it wasn't war-torn, because yeah. whenever you have a war-torn area, you can't spread the gospel. No. You know, it, people are hunkering down and trying to survive. But the Pax Romana, yeah. which means the Roman peace, um, that allowed them to, you know, move throughout that empire. With and, much more freedoms. Yeah, with a lot more freedom. And Even safety. sailing. I mean, that, that's, that's something we don't think a lot. You know, sailing was not a normal means. I mean, it was a much dangerous. It still was dangerous to, even during Roman time. All was shipwrecked, right? We know it was dangerous. But they had gotten it down almost to a science. They had been trading. They knew. By the way, does everybody know why Paul shipwrecked? Obviously, God wanted them to. But there's a big key. Why? Anybody know why? They went to a port. It was, says what season it was, and it wasn't a good season, and they ventured out and tried to sail anyway. So uh, this is a shell. They knew full and well it wasn't smart to travel. That time of the year, especially over by Cyprus, Crete, that in, into the middle of the Mediterranean, is very dangerous to go in the open ocean with the storms that would come. But sure enough, they knew that. They just didn't listen and heed to common sense. But they had, I mean, Rome had connected the empire and the world like it never had been before. In steps Jesus. Perfect moment. Perfect time. And you could see that it was because nothing spreads like that unless it's perfectly planned and executed. And there's nothing more perfect than God's plan. That's what I'm kind of hope we see in verses 5 through 7. So he sent him what? To redeem those who were under the law. It makes that real clear. Everybody that was under the Old Testament, they've been paid back and bought. Shouldn't they understand what that word means? A lot of us might not. Redeeming is to buy someone or something back. And the old law, that was a big concept. Your brother was in slavery. You had an obligation to redeem them. Um, or you should, right? So redemption is this buying someone back that is unable to pay the, the debt. Isn't that the case with us and God? That debt was insurmountable. Only we have redemption because Christ came and adopted us. Made that possible. Verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your, our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know, the Jews, they wouldn't even call him my father. How's a Christian relationship with God? It's real close. Abba being an Aramaic form of saying father. So he's saying, as Christians, you can cry out, Father, Father, and you know he hears you. For you are no longer a slave under the law, but a son, Christians. And if a son, then an heir through God. Real, real crystal... One of those sections of scripture, if you want to really show someone the old law was done away with, this should be where you, I, at least where I think we should go. So we'll move a little bit further. Form, now he gives, He's going to switch up tactics, okay? He's been trying to, to argue why he's right. Now he's just going to, this is very, one of the harshest condemnations that Paul has ever given. So he finds a way to sprinkle this in here, by the way, and I think that's done in, in, on purpose. He has tried to encourage them up to this point. He's tried to get them back on their own, off of his arguments, off his reasoning, off his logic. Now is the, now I have a condemnation against you. How quickly they had changed from what they knew to be right. So it says in verse 8, formerly when you did not know God, they had used to be idolaters. Anybody know what kind of idol, idols they, they worshipped here in, in Galatia? All sorts. They are an idolatrous people. They had been once enslaved by idolatry, and they're going to turn around and be enslaved now by the law. That make any sense to you? You once were enslaved to idols, you left them for Christ and found freedoms, and you're about to turn right around and become enslaved by something even more ridiculous. That's Paul's argument, right? So, but now that you have come to know, I'm oh, sorry, you were enslaved by, to those that by nature are not God's but now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, notice this, and this is real, the, the condemnation of it. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless things or elementary principles you put under the law? Why would you ever go back to those things that once enslaved you, once you've tasted freedom? Could you imagine sitting in a jail cell for 40 years, tasting freedom, and say, you know, I would just rather go back to my jail? I, you hear about it, by the way. There's people that are incarcerated that they, they choose that, by the way. They'd rather be incarcerated. That's a real shame. I don't understand that. Because once, I, once you have a taste of freedom, how could you ever go back? And they had left idols to go back to the law. 
It was no better than their former place, was it? It was the same kind of pit of sin and separation from God. It just had a different kind of flavor to it, didn't it? Um, and unfortunately, they're falling for it. So they're not supposed to be enslaved. Whose slaves you once you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Anybody want to take a stab at this? I'm hoping maybe Ben or someone else. But what do you think he's in reference to? The days, months, seasons, years. Is that like uh, pagan traditions or holidays or something like that? I, first, I thought that, Jason. It's more, more towards the Jewish keeping of the... So they had kept Sabbaths and days and months and festivals. And, but think about that, Jason. I bring up your point. They did keep... Fe festival keeping and pagan idolatry was absolutely rampant. In fact, almost every day in the Roman calendar was dedicated to some god or goddess. So they would keep festivals left and right. That's a good point to make. They had left those festivals to come over to these ones, right, that, that were not meant to be here, weren't meant, was not God's intended religion for them, was it? He had binded back. That's what religion means. To, God had binded man back to him by Christ, and they were about to leave that behind for something that was never intended to save man. We talked about what was the purpose of the law to bring people to Christ. That law didn't save anybody. God did. God saved those that tried to keep the law, but it's not their record keeping that saved them. So they were going to go back to keeping the Sabbath. They were going to go back to keeping the Passover. And they were going to go back to keeping... They had never kept these things before in their life. I mean, they're going to have to learn it all over. But why? Because they're not Jews. You see the, the real problem here. They're going to leave everything they had in Christ to go back to something that never was to save a person. It was just to prepare the way for the one that would. So verse 11, I'm afraid I may have labored, labored over you in vain. Let that sink in. I hope those words are never said to anybody by me here, that, I, that my, my work in you is wasted. That's in essence what he's saying to them. You want to say, this is very strong condemnation. If you won't listen to my reason, you won't listen to my logic, then listen to my, my love and voice for you. You're going to waste everything that I've done in you by going back to things that will make you slaves again. And that will make you a prisoner. I just never understood that concept. Maybe that's because I haven't really had my freedoms taken away. That, but I can't imagine once you've been enslaved by something, you'd ever want to step back foot to that. And many of us, guess what? When we sin on a regular basis, we step our foots back in the shackle every single time. Because really, who is our master if we keep running back to it and we leave behind our Christ? Uh, go ahead, Ben. You know, I've seen it firsthand. I saw Larry one time visiting with a family, and he would try to talk about religious things, and they would shift the conversation to football, and then they'd try to take it back to religion, and then they'd take it to hunting, and on and on. And, and finally he left, and he, and he, he was, had tears in his eyes, I remember. And he said, they're just not hungry for it anymore. No, no. And I, I'm sure Larry wouldn't see it as wasted time, but can't help but kind of feel that when you're going through that, can you? I mean, that's well, we go visiting, we see that more than we care. People that just really aren't thirsting for it like we would want them to. Can't make them. Wish to, but it just doesn't work that way. Uh, and it is. It's not a wasted labor. I, I'll make it real clear. I think we've been visiting enough that we've seen this not a waste of time. And I don't think Paul is meaning them to take it that way. He's saying if you won't correct yourself, you will be wasted labor. I mean, how could it not be looked at as such? They had come so far, and they're going to leave it all because someone told them that's what they should do. And anybody comes to you and says very dogmatic that you have to do this or you're not right with God, that should give you, sometimes it should let off, you know, your dog ears. It doesn't sound right. But I venture to say the Church of Galatia needed that, right? So that doesn't sound right. But here's the thing, we have the scriptures, they didn't, so let's not beat them over the head too bad. But the truth is, we ought to be mindful. When people come telling us things, it just doesn't sound right, we ought to be careful. These were gullible people. I, I hate to use that word. They were Gentiles that were easily manipulated because they knew the Jews were close to God, and they just assumed, well, they won't lead us astray, you know. But that is not the case, is it? So we continue along in this section. We're going to move quite quickly through this. Uh, you can read this for yourself, the, the days, months. Jason, this is the thing I was looking into. At least what uh, this commentary 
commentators say, because I looked it up too. I wasn't sure if I was right or wrong. More of the Jewish festivals, the Jewish feasts, the days, months, years thing, but very much might have a connection back to their pagan upbringing. And so we get into a new section, and I want to say this is probably a great place for us to get close to being finished. Anybody know what an allegory is? Pause. I don't want you to cheat too bad. You had a chance, right? What's an allegory? Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to put it. I would say, see if I can find in my notes. All right, allegory, well, we could just read the definition. That's what I eventually wanted to. But yes, it is a symbolic fictional story that conveys a meaning, not explicitly set forth. So it's, you get a story, but it has a deeper meaning to it. And sometimes it's not the meaning you anticipate. That would be a good way to put an allegory. Allegories are very popular. Uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the book. Uh, Tale of Two Cities, so that'd be a good, uh, have you ever read that book? Might be, I'll have to look that one up. There are a lot of allegorical books, especially from the 1700s, 1800s. They were very, very prevalent, especially in England. Well, let's say Gulliver's Travels, you ever read that book? That is heavily allegorical to, to British imperialism. Um, so that gives you some ideas. It's, it's a, you ever read Gulliver's Travels? This guy becomes a giant and he goes to some pygmy small end. Great example. Anyways, you've never seen the movie, you never read the book, you should, uh, but there's a deeper message to it. It looks fantastical. You've got this guy that's a giant compared to everybody else, but he's actually enslaved to them. Uh, it, long story short. So there's, all, there's deeper meaning to it. it. It actually is supposed to relate back to British, British England, right? So that's an example of an allegory. There are allegories in Scripture. Um, can anybody think of one? Parables are probably the closest thing. I'm, I'm trying to think of an allegory Jesus gave. Uh, but yeah, they're similar. Parables are a, a, parables we define as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. These are a little even deeper than that. Um, I'll, we'll give you, I'll give you Paul's example. He's going to bring up Sarah and Hagar. Everybody know Sarah and Hagar? Who's Sarah? Abraham's wife, and who, what son does she have? Which son does she have? Isaac, right? Hagar. Whose son does she have? Ishmael. Paul is going to flip them. You always associate Isaac with being a Jew, and you always associate Ishmael with being a, a Gentile. He's going to flip it. He's going to say, all those Judaizers that are coming at you are like Ishmael. They're going, to, they're going to persecute you and poke fun at you. Just like when you read the example, the story of Ishmael and Isaac, what happens between those two? Why is Ishmael sent away? Yeah, deeper even than that, though, Ishmael does something. The Bible's not very clear. I'll give you a hint. It says he laughs at Isaac. I don't think he laughed at him. There's a deeper meaning to that. I'll leave it for you to do and to study. Uh, the la- one of the examples where that Hebrew word laughed at is used is when um, Isaac is with his wife. And it says that the king saw them laughing together and knew they weren't sister and brother, but they were a husband and wife. So what do you think the connotation, again, it's, it's a very strange word to hear, or again, how to translate it. The other example is where, uh, you ever heard of the golden calf? They rose up and, to play. That's the same word that is used of laughter. Sometimes, not, again, not saying it, look it for yourself, but there was persecution. Ishmael persecuted Isaac. Then Sarah persecutes Hagar. But she was going to do that, period. But read the account again. Ishmael does something, and that's what he's going to play on, is Ishmael persecuted Isaac. And he's going to say, just like the Judaizers are persecuting the Gentiles, trying to make them be circumcised. So it's an allegory. Every time you think of Sarah, you think of the Jewish nation. You think of Hagar, you think of these foreign Gentiles, right? She's not Jew. He's going to flip it. He's going to say, you want to be Hagar. You want to be the sons of Hagar, because they're truly the sons of freedom. So just he flips it, and that's what an allegory. So study this some more next week. Uh, so I think we probably should leave. Maybe we can get another verse in here just to give you an idea. So he makes it real clear it is an allegory. It's very important for an allegory that you know it has a deeper meaning, correct? Um, So he says in verse 24 of Galatians 4, Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. So we know Sarah is associated with the Old Testament, right? He's going to flip this a bit. He's going to turn it on its head. That's an allegory. How you thought it would go is going to be the total opposite. So he says one is from Mount Sinai under the old law. 
bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar, which is interesting. Hagar is not really associated with the law, but here he is going to. So Hagar is the Old Testament. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. What's the focus of this whole book? There are people coming from Jerusalem that were saying, you have to be circumcised. So he's connecting these two together. He says, just like Hagar is Mount Sinai, these Judaizers are Hagar's children because she is in slavery with her children. Continue along. But the Jerusalem above, that's real big. What's the Jerusalem above? Heaven, the church, the bride of Christ. You can all of those above, right? But in Jerusalem above is free. That's Christ, the church. And she is our mother, talking about, uh, I want to say Hagar. Arms might be Sarah. This is where it gets confusing. Read these sections. We'll cover them next week. We'll read to the end of this. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, Gentiles, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. That would have been a real dagger twist, by the way. For any of the Jewish people that were reading this, maybe they were the ones saying, you need to be circumcised. What Paul is saying is, the Gentiles are truly Isaac's son. These Judaizers, they come from Hagar. That would have been the biggest insult I think they could have probably heard. They loved being associated with Abraham, didn't they? And that means they would have immediately saw themselves as Sarah's children. And he turns it on his head and says, nope, the Gentiles are truly Isaac's children or, or Sarah's children, and the Judaizers are really the ones that are the slave children. Um, that would have really perturbed some people, right? If you were a Jew and you hear the Gentiles are God's sons, but the Jews aren't, and that's really, he meant it that way. He wanted it to hurt a bit because they weren't Abraham's sons anymore. It had always been, right? It had always been Abraham's children spiritually. You ever, just because they were Jews did not make them right with God. Just because they had been Abraham's children did not mean they were going to be right and make it to heaven, did it? It was because they had faith in God that they would. So the same is true for us and the Gentiles today. We can't rely on our own selves, can't rely on old practices. You've got to put those past things away and look to Christ. He's the only one that can save. So this evening, if you... Have ever desired to become a Christian? It's simple what you need to do. You've got to find a way to put your own ego aside and try to be a child of God. And that first means you've got to desire it. You've got to want it. Uh, from there, you've got to hear the message. Jesus is the Son of God. You've got to believe that he died on a cross, that he arose from the dead, that he's in heaven now. That's so all things you have to know are true. So that's belief, not just a, I hope or I think or I pray, right? It's I know. From there, you're going to repent of your sins. That's changed the way that you live your life. You're going to confess Jesus as your Christ every day that you live. And from there, you'll be baptized for the remission of sins. That's where we become truly Abraham's heirs, where we can be like Isaac and sons of promise. That's what you want this evening. That's there for you. It's obtainable. You don't have to keep the old law to do it. It's beautiful. Beautiful thing. From there is the hard part, though. You've got to still keep a law. Not like we have zero obligations, do we? We might not keep the old law, but we better keep Christ's. And let me say this, Christ's law is much easier to keep, but when you get into the details of it, it's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard to pray for your enemy? Isn't it hard to do what's right? Isn't it hard to always look out for others? Isn't it hard to put people before yourself? You might find yourself right there this evening where you're saying, I don't know if I can go any further. I've done those first things, but I can't keep going, Christ. Well, let's make sure you get to the realization that you will, you can, and he'll help you do that if you only ask. might be the case that you have some need this evening. I pray that you'll come as we stand and as we sing. of a noonday's glare for the harvest time is coming on and the reaper's work will soon be done will your seeds be many will you garner any for the gathering at the harvest home
Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the still and solemn night? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, for a harvest pure and white? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Seize me, many will you garner, any for the gathering at the harvest home. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, all along the fertile way? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, you must reap at the last great day? For the harvest time is come on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your seed be many with garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? Great to see everybody out this evening. We're going to try to go through the list that I have, um, and then we'll open the floor for those that have any updates. Uh, we want to keep Linda Fiscus in our prayer. She has continued testing coming up. Uh, pray for her as that's going on. Pray that you have good results to come. Uh, Rodney Priester, keep him in your prayers as he has a cancer diagnosis. Just be with the Priester family. Keep them in your minds this week. We want to keep Gabe's brother, Will, in our prayers as he had a tour ACL. Um, that he'll be having surgery, they think, at the end of March, or at least roughly around then. So keep him in your thoughts. Um, want to keep all those that are overseas fighting for our freedoms. We had a few. I uh, want to keep Mike in our, our prayers. And I want to say that Lori Barron's with us. Uh, who is it that you know that's uh, serving on the USS Eisenhower? Her nephew. Does anybody know? I'm bad with names, so I didn't write. David. Okay. So we want to keep both David and Mike in our prayers as they're both uh, been stationed other places. I've heard a few, well, at least heard somewhere online that they're going to be deploying some more troops to, to work on that kind of uh, raft that they'll be sending in aid into Gaza. So just keep everybody that's overseas in our prayers because there's just a lot going on right now. I definitely want to keep those two in our prayers as they're uh, here from our local area, but keep everyone you know. Keep Jim and Arlene Smith, uh, keep Lori and Rick, keep that whole family in your prayers. We've got a lot going on. We were able to see them last week. I didn't get to this week. It's a bit of a drive, but do um, you have any updates from them, Carl? Are they doing all right? Yeah, it is. And that's, that's one of those things, being there for them, visiting as much as we can, at least letting them know. I know when I saw them, they really miss everyone here. So just, just keep them in your prayers. They, they really have a hard time. They wish they could be here. Um, we wish they could be too. So that being said, hopefully one of these days, soon enough, it'll be the, the case that they will. Uh, so keep Steve uh, Maul in your prayers as he has uh, cataracts surgery coming up in March. Uh, I'm assuming the end of March. So you'll have a little bit more info next week then. Okay. We'll, we'll keep Steve as he's got ongoing tests coming up and also appointments, but keep us updated for that. We'll, we'll keep you in our prayers. Uh, Want to keep Rich. Uh, I know I have written down. We talked about this last week. And I didn't write anything new. Is this Miss Linda relative? Still, still not doing much better this week. I know you had, we had put in here that he was having something getting into his blood. Is that kind of stopped or is it still the same case? M pneumonia, okay. So we'll definitely keep Rich in our prayers as continues. He's there home at hospice. Definitely never good when you hear those. But that being said, we want to pray for Rich. Uh, want to keep Mike Luke in our prayers as he has his... Uh, Ear surgery coming up at the, I want to say he told me last time it'd be around Easter, um, so that's coming soon. That being said, keep Mike in your prayers. Uh, have Brandy, I want to pray that her tests go well. Any updates on that, right? That's uh, Biden Howers? She had it today. Okay, well, good. We'll know the results coming up. Well, let's pray that those results are well, and um, 
Pray that all that continues to go well. I'm going to keep uh, Janice, well, this is from Janice. Keep Ray and Faye uh, in your prayers. I saw them today. Ray's had some test updates. But not, uh, I don't know all the details, but keep them in your prayers. Uh, there's just a lot going on in that family, and, you know, they've got, every time you turn around, sometimes it seems like something else comes up. So just keep both of them in your thoughts this week. Uh, glad to see Asher's back with us without pink in his eyes, so that's a nice, uh, nice added bonus. But want to keep them in our prayers. Glad that's that's gone. Alexis. Uh, okay, so Alexis, this is uh, a student at her school that she that she works with. So she is her first day back was yesterday. We're glad to hear that. So those are good news. News news is good news to hear. Uh, Kathy doesn't have a surgery coming up this week on Thursday. But what what day has it been changed to? April second. So you had some not great results from your ankle. Okay. Echo. Good night if I can hear. Echo cardiogram came back. Well, we'll definitely keep praying for that and hope that the, the surgery doesn't move another date. Those are never fun. Echo. Yeah, let's hope it doesn't, right? Uh, we'll keep praying for you, Kathy. Uh, and you said echocardiogram. Let's see if I can spell that correctly. But uh, pray, pray that she continues to improve. Um, Glad to hear Eli. He's not with us here this evening, but I was able to stop by. I think Bill and Kathy were, too. Uh, he's doing better. He was at least able to come outside when I pick up the kids or today. So keep him in your prayers. Uh, he, his first day to school was, I think, Monday. So just he's got a lot going on. Pray for him. That, but his, from what I heard, procedure went well. Everything's doing fine on that regard. Uh, this is Ariana. That'd be Mary Laird's niece that's in the hospital. She's over in Children's and is having kidney failure. Uh, anyways, keep that family on, in your prayers. She had to go back to the hospital. She was back home and then had to go back to the hospital. She's on dialysis. So that, just definitely keep Ariana in your prayers and, and Mary, all the family as well. Oh, my. So not sure how, how to pronounce that. Hematote. Blood clot. We'll just keep it. Pray, pray for Ariana. That's a lot for a 16-year-old to go through. Period. But that's all. That's compounding issues. So just keep praying for her and pray for the whole family. They can get comfort going through going through this. Good, Frank. Ah, but Jim Graham. He's been on our prayer list. Uh, cancer. He, they found two spots on his lung. Uh, that so. Keep Jim in your prayers. Uh, we definitely will. I had a few others to go through, and I'll open it a little bit for, for others. So um, right, River Schaefer, he has been in our prayer list for a while. Uh, Kathy had brought uh, his name back to our attention. He is going through leukemia, has a leukemia diagnosis. He's back in children. So just pray for, uh, pray for River, uh, pray for his family. I want to keep Harmony. Miss Richards, how did that every, all well? Oh, so we got a little ways to go. Okay, okay. You know, I feel like you said that last week, and I've completely forgot. So let's just put, for the foreseeable future. That might stick better with me. <laughs> I want to keep Jason, uh, this is David Uru. Unru, okay. And I still have the paper up here, so I can read it for us. Uh, he's in the hospital dealing with bleeding and other issues. Uh, he's got a long way to go to recovery. Keep him in your prayers. Do you have any updates or changes? No. Brain function. That's good to hear. So we'll keep... No, well, we'll keep David in our prayers. That's uh, definitely tough. Uh, glad to hear, though, he's improving some. I can take off the TV set update. That's done. Uh, keep Marshall Moore's father uh, in our prayers. His, his father's name's Marshall as well. I didn't get an update. I planned to text him and I forgot. But he's got a very aggressive form of brain cancer. Um, so pray for that family. It's a good, great family. And it's, it, I like cancer happens to everybody's family. But it's, it's harsher sometimes when it has such a great one. Um, Kendall had put on a baseball friend named Gavin who had broke his wrist in two places. Pray that 
that goes well. I'm not sure if they'll have surgery or not, but that's uh, you have update. Three months of recovery. Well, if he can avoid surgery, that's a good thing. That, uh, keep keep Gavin in your prayers. Uh, the last note I have is uh, Scott is watching me. Uh, so anyway, Scott's not even here to enjoy that. He wrote that on my paper. Thankfully, I caught that before this evening. But uh, I thought I'd say it out loud anyways because he's messing with my notes. Uh, anybody have anyone to add? Good, Stephanie. Mike Graff is back in the hospital. Okay. Well, I, had a, I didn't know, but uh, I should have asked more of when Jesse asked me for his phone number. I should have maybe known. So, anyways, that that's, gives more detail why. Uh, but Oh, my. So, definitely keep Mike Graff as he's back in the hospital with that leg, and it looks like he has cellulitis uh, in that leg. So, keep the Graff family in your prayers. I think I saw Kathy's hand go up. Mm-hmm. Yep. No. We'll pray for Tyne. That's I, I talked to Mar, Larry Marsha. They said she. I think she had two more weeks in the boot. Uh, so she's definitely not enjoying it. But we'll keep her in our prayers. She had another one, Kathy. Meckling, Meckling. I'm good. Okay. We will definitely keep, keep Judy. I know I've been in touch with them, but they, she's been out of the hospital for the last few weeks. Good. Yep. Glad to hear that. I got to talk, chat with her for a minute. So she's, she's got to see another specialist, I think, for that MRI, but that's at least good to hear. Uh, we've got those to keep in our prayers. So Judy, Meckling, Julie Delp, uh, and then Tyne Cogley. Just keep, in, keep them in your prayers. Anybody else we need to add? Glad to hear. Good visiting this day. I, I try, to, try to think of those uh, that you know aren't doing well. Uh, keep them in your prayers this week, and if you can, go see them. So if there's nothing else to add, let's close with a word of prayer. Dearly Father, we come to you at this day with many names in our minds, and dearly Father, we bring each one of them to you at this time. There's many that we didn't even announce, and, and pray, Lord, that you be with each one, and, and you know their names, and you know them individually. We're thankful that we have that kind of relationship with you, that you care for us all individually, and pray that you'll be with them and touch them and heal them. Dearly Father, be with the doctors and nurses that are ministering over them. Pray that you'll be with all those that have upcoming tests and procedures, MRIs, different situations and ailments of life. We pray that you'll help them and comfort them through these times as they go through the pains and agonies of this life. Dearly Father, help us to realize that it's worth it all. Dearly Father, that being faithful to you is all that matters. The troubles of this life will pass, but being faithful to you is what matters most. And we pray that you'll encourage us and strengthen us to power through even when we feel like we can't. Dearly Father, help us to see that we're not just slaves of yours, but we're your sons. And dearly Father, that you love us each, and we are your children, and we pray, Lord, that we'll take that love that you've given to us and we'll extend it to others, and that we'll not uh, be discouraged and displaced, but we'll try to shine your light and shine Christ to all the people that we meet. We're so thankful for all he's done for us and the death he gave on the cross. It's in through his name that we pray. Amen.